Hello, BookTube. All right, we're continuing on with our 12.8K Q&A, and we are up to Bobby Joe. Uh, congratulations on 12.8K followers. I am an avid cookbook collector and wonder if you have any faves. You don't have to cook to enjoy cookbooks. I agree with that completely. I largely can't cook anything that's adventurous, that requires a lot of concentration, because all of my concentration in the kitchen is given over to not hurting myself. I have very little in the way of sense of touch. So hot things, sharp things, the bad idea to do so uh, and i don't have the patience for it anyway or the imagination the creativity that it takes but for instance there was i've jotted it down here russell norman wrote a book called polpo years ago i don't recommend using any of most of the recipes a lot of the recipes in in polpo involve killing and eating beings who are as intelligent as you are so i don't i don't involve i don't advocate doing it but i thought the book was lovely it actually made one of my year-end best lists uh and also the way to cook by julia child a terrific book. An amazing thing to midwife, one would say, if one were in a position to say that. It's an amazing thing. It's a, it's, it, it captures a lot of her. It's, it's, you're right. You don't need to cook to love The Way to Cook by Julia Child. Uh, Nick Piccarelli says, number one, I recently read Behave by Robert Sapolsky and was curious what you thought of his stance on free will. Do you find it convincing? I never understand the fault are all about free will. I really don't. I, with it, whether it's him or Sam Harris or anybody else, I really don't understand it. I don't understand people saying, questioning, or even or even stating that it doesn't exist or that most most elements of it don't exist. That's insane. It's just crazy thinking. If you're religious, then stay religious and just state it that way. But don't. Uh, it's complex. I, I love the book. I'm staring right at it. I, lo I love the book. Uh, but I don't agree with all parts of it. That would be one part where I would have a lot of arguments with the author. Uh, and mm, you had a second question, right? Number two, what was your favorite food while living in Italy? Uh, spaghetti alla bussara in Venice, but made a particular way, made a particularly Venetian way with all Venetian ingredients and usually by a woman who's 150 years old or something like that. But that would be my favorite. I've never, I've had it a couple of times in the United States, never anything like what I had in Venice almost every week. So uh, I, I would say spaghetti alla bussara. Uh, let's see here. Alan Black says, number one, did you finish John Gwynn, the John Gwynn book, Shadow of the Gods? Is it worth reading? I did finish it. It's very, very good. Epic fantasy. Very, very good. Both those volumes are well worth having. If you're at your local library book sale, for instance, and you see them both with dust jackets and hardcover, get them. Absolutely get them. Uh, this is going to be a trilogy. It might not stop at a trilogy, but it's going to be a trilogy that's well worth reading. Uh, question number two, thoughts on the current Jordan Peterson Twitter meltdown? Uh, it's, it's a little bit weird to me. This guy's constant, he's a multimillionaire. His constant need for attention is weird to me. Uh, those of you maybe not know the meltdown, it involves the actress Ellen Page, who recently paid a huge amount of money to find a team of doctors willing to ignore their Hippocratic oath and destroy her body in order to simulate a man's body. And she now goes by Elliot Page. And had a, a you know, a, a sexy photo spread in Vanity Fair as a man with, with surgery scars from where she found and subverted doctors to, to, to ignore the first part of the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, and destroy a pair of perfectly healthy breasts because of a momentary conviction on the part of the person. I, <sighs> Naturally, Ellen Page now wants to be called Elliot Page and wants you to say that Elliot Page is a man. Uh, Elliot Page is not biologically male, but if Elliot Page wants to be called a man, then fine. Elliot Page has certainly gone as far as you can go to demonstrate your desire to be called a man. Uh, and Jordan Peterson was on Twitter saying, no, I won't do that. I've been booted off Twitter because I won't do that. If, if a trans person has been willing to have extensive body maiming surgery, have perfectly healthy breasts destroyed because of their conviction, fine. Uh, then, it, it, then it's not only crazy to keep referring to them by an old set of pronouns, an old, an old gender identity, it's also incredibly rude. Uh, the only thing I don't like about it, the only way in which I am even remotely allied here with people like Jordan Peterson and against Elliot Page is when Elliot Page just matter-of-factly dismissively and very condescendingly says, yeah, I've always been this way. No, you haven't. <laughs> no, you haven't. 
you've lived your whole life in public. You're a raving egomaniac. So it's easy to demonstrate that you haven't always been. This hasn't always been true. Elliot Page even insisted that that line be worked into the Umbrella Academy. When the character, her character, his character shows up as a man who was a woman for the first season of the show. And doesn't just say, I am now someone else and give the name, but also say, it's always been true. That kind of retroactive rewriting of reality is my only problem with any of this these trends in the 21st century is them saying not just this is the way I want you to treat me but this is ontologically real and always has been <laughs> when I don't get to rewrite any of your reality <laughs> you should not get to rewrite any of mine uh, but uh, I think it's ridiculous on Jordan Peterson's part it's ridiculous it's it's grandstanding it's also incredibly rude I don't think he would refer to Elliot Page as a woman if he was in the room with Elliot Page, I don't think he would do that. Unless he's so far gone, unless he's Joe Rogan, unless he just doesn't care about what effect he's having on other people, I don't think he would. It's a complex subject. It's it, and the the most of the proponents of it with the blue check marks on Twitter do not care whether or not you are an ally. They only want you to step out of line so they can destroy you. That's all they want. That's what they love is destroying you. They don't care whether or not you are progressive in your thought. They, they're not interested in trans people. Uh, and uh, that's the part that I hate. That naturally is the part that I hate. I don't like bullies. I don't like people telling me that, I, that you know, well, Star Trek has always been all lesbian. What Star Trek were you watching? I, I was watching it when you hadn't yet been born, when your parents hadn't yet been born. Things like that, the, this meta-reality claims by the blue check marks on Twitter are the thing that they lose me on. That's the thing that I hate. Uh, not the, the concepts themselves. Uh, but anyway, uh, CVBN457, I was wondering when CVBN457 was going to return. Uh, littered the last Q&A with comments. Uh, and one for the road, oh my god, does that mean there are more? Uh, a statement, thank you. Thank you for caring about more than views or image. Thank you for engaging with and caring for your subscribers on such a meaningful level. Yeah, I was just vilifying you. Uh, you don't have to take it this far, but you do anyway. And thank you for being a sensible and genuine person in a world full of phonies. Until we meet again, Spaminator out. Oh, no. Those are our more, there are more comments from the Spaminator. Well, thank you for saying all that. But, uh, you know, I'm I, he's right back at you. I'm, I'm more grateful to BookTube than BookTube is to me. Uh, and besides, when you say don't have to take it this far, what does that mean? Of course, if you're my friends, I'm going to look for books for you. And want to help you with advice or whatever. <laughs> uh, anyway, Matt Sheridan, congratulations, St. Donahue. Question number one, what are your thoughts on Stephen King's on writing? Trying to wind me up, are you? The Bible of all online writing people. Every bit as bad as everything else this author wrote. Uh, number two, when are you and Frida going to meet Mark Richardson's new dog? No idea. Uh, certainly not during epic home construction. Uh, Ferdy says, hi, Steve, you've mentioned before you've, you're not a fan of Raymond Carver's work. You know, put it mildly. Uh, what do you dislike most about his writing? It's not his. He's a fraud. That's what I most dislike about it. It's all posturing. It's all posing. None of it's real. The parts of it that are in any way genuine were created by other people. It's, it's all fake. It's all designed for dude bro consumption. It's not actual writing at all. Uh, why do you think he was being hailed as a story, a short story phenomenon? Because he's easy. Same as the rest of Dude Bro. It's an, he's an adrenaline trip. They don't read Raymond Carver. They take him. Yeah, man. Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah, have you read, have you read Raymond Carver's Juvenilia? It's written in crayon. And no one's ever published and no one's ever seen. That's the real good stuff, man. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> will they read an actual meat potatoes novel? Not to save their life. Not to save their life will they do it. And yet they'll say they're the most advanced and, and inquiring readers of them all. Utterly ridiculous. They're the most cloistered man babies in the reading world. They're druggies. They're potheads, basically. Only they're using books uh, for that. And it's easy to spot once you know what you're looking for. They won't read a real book. And I would argue that the ones who are too far gone, well into the Raymond Carver world, can't read a new book anymore. They don't have the ability to sit down and read The Last Samurai by Helen DeWitt, for instance. They don't have the ability to do it, most of them. Uh, anymore. They've eroded it by just taking drug hits instead of reading books. Uh, 
Richard Reed says, I love your book too. What's the best account of Lincoln that includes his negative qualities as well as positive? Oh, a. Lincoln by White does a pretty good job, but no Lincoln biography that I've read has been free of hagiography, except for ones that aren't soup to nuts, the ones that look at small portions of his life. Some of those are very, very good. There's a book uh, about Lincoln as president-elect. There's a book about uh, Lincoln as a moral figure that you would think would go overboard on the hagiography, and instead it just just the opposite. Some little keyhole... Ordinarily, I don't like keyhole studies of, of biographical figures. I like big biographies, but the big biographies tend with him and, and Washington tend to be just saints' lives. So I, those smaller ones, the more keyhole ones, don't tend to do that. Uh, Leo Perkara says, uh, Hello, Steve. Do you like the sequels of Gentleman Bastard series by Scott Lynch? I do, yeah, but not as much. Uh, it seems that a lot of these new giants of fantasy underdeliver on the next few books. I agree. I agree. Usually, I think the reason is very simple. I think they only have the one book in them. But that's not what uh, fantasy publishers want at all. They want, if they sign on with you, they want to know, can you stretch this thing out to 20 books? I, the lies, I, the Scott, Scott Lynch is a perfect example. The first book should have been a standalone book on its own and is beautiful as such a thing. The rest, I agree, they sort of lose lose momentum. Uh, is there a long fantasy series or FS series, seven volumes or more, let's say, that you liked completely? Well, the Emberverse series by S.M. Sterling uh, that starts with Dies the Fire. Uh, but I'm not sure. I, I liked it from beginning to end. Same thing mostly with David Weber's Safehold books, but I won't say that that's because they hold up. I don't. I think it, with, with the Emberverse series is really there's you get completely hooked because of the way S.M. Sterling writes, you get completely hooked in the story, but the books usually don't. <laughs> no, usually they don't. I would say it should probably have stopped at book five, a meeting at Corvallis, and just stop there. Uh, you, instead of just going on and on and on and on and on with no point to it at all. Uh, but there were fans for it. It, it. Those books would sell in hardcover, and the author and the publisher knew that, so it just went on. Uh, Sean G says, uh, hello, Steve. I have emailed you my questions for this Q&A. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, Jasper, John, he's joking about the fact that you, if you email me questions for q and I'm going to ignore them. Uh, Jasper John Antonelli, why do you think that All Quiet on the Western Front is taught and not Storm of Steel? Teachers probably just don't know about Storm of Steel. Teachers, you know, they're, they're going on momentum. You've got a certain book buying budget. Can you use the books from last year? Or 10 years ago or 20 years ago if you can you probably will uh what the the only in america the only popular edition of storm of steel is a 20 dollar penguin paperback that's not going to fly in public schools uh, why do you dislike 2001 a space odyssey it's slow yeah but the visuals are amazing i don't agree that the visuals are amazing they mostly aren't if you weren't helped by stanley kubrick i don't think you'd find the visuals amazing uh, and if you take the visuals away, your assessment is completely true and also answers your question. It's slow. It's a boring book. Uh, finally, if you had to choose the national canon of one language to read only from one year, which would it be? It would be Ireland, of course. Uh, Aaron Facer, if you could choose one figure to represent the great city of Boston, who would it be? Oh my, there are so many. And what do you mean by represent? Do you want to represent the bad stuff as well as the good? That would be James Michael Curley. Uh, but I would probably say Samuel Eliot Morrison, the great historian Samuel Eliot Morrison. I was born and died in Boston, lived in a house that I know well. I know its history as well as he did. I learned its history from him. <laughs> uh, and it had physical courage when needed, had patriotism when needed, was a gentleman scholar, was a lifetime entirely bounded up with the sea and with books. I think that's pretty, pretty good for Boston. Uh, he never smuggled anything, as far as I know, but other than that... Uh, Joel Swagman says, you mentioned a few times you're a big Livy fan. Is it true Livy's style declined in quality as his history went on? No, it is not. And anyone who tells you that doesn't know what they're talking about. Oh, and, and if so, is this noticeable in English translations? It's not noticeable because it didn't happen. Uh, Anthony Ruggiero says, number one, is Frank McLean's biography of Fitzroy McLean worth getting? It is, very much so. But definitely don't miss McLean's own book, Eastern Approaches. There are many editions that are used. I'm sure you can find one for 2 or $3 online. Don't miss Eastern Approaches. It is a fantastic, fantastic book. Far more important that you read that and reread it, know it, than that you read any biography of the author. 
Uh, number two, where would one start with James Elroy Flecker, the plays the poem? I would say don't. I'm sure that you don't know Shakespeare well enough to be reading Flecker. But if you're going to start anyway, if you're going to pull a dude, bro, then read the poems. Definitely start with the poems. But I guarantee you, you don't know Shakespeare well enough uh, to be asking that question. Uh, and number three, are MMK's memoirs any good? Yes, they are. I think you wrote three volumes. They're all, I've read one of them a couple of times. I've read all of them at least once. They are, they're very good. Uh, number four, did you review that new book about the source of the Nile by Candace Millard? I did not. I have not reviewed it. I don't think that I will. I think that it will just pass me by. Uh, but I did read it, and it's very good. Uh, Bryce Fuqua says, I did not realize that, that Winston Groom also w was also a military historian. Yes, primarily a military historian. What did you think of his nonfiction books? They're very good. They're, they're, uh, they're very good. Better than his fiction. Uh, William Fett says, Hi, Steve. What author and book did you enjoy the most for June on the Range? Uh, Homer Kelton. Uh, Elmer Kelton. Uh, the author Elmer Kelton is the author that I like the most for June on the Range. Uh, did you find a new author you will be reading more of because of that event? Elmer Kelton, I will definitely. He's written a ton of things. I only read a handful of them. I think I read four by the time June was over. Next June on the Range, I will read a lot more. Uh, what are your opinions of John Dixon Carr and Walter Lord? Uh very different writers, and my opinions would take a lot longer than a Q&A can afford. I like them both in what they do. Uh, certainly everybody should read The Night Lives On, or uh, Night to Remember by Walter Lord, his Titanic book. Everyone should read that. Uh, let's see here. E.V. says, Hi, Steve. What do you think of the rationalist community and the kind of books they seem to write? The Scout Mindset, The Precipice, for example. Are they worth checking? No, they're not. You know already I'm going to say that. No. They are not. The rationalist movement is not worth checking out. It's just a bunch of bunk. Just a bunch of, of guys li who like listening to themselves talk. That's all. It's all talk about nothing. It goes nowhere. It's tail chasing. It means nothing. It connects with the real world in not one way at all. And at no point, it's just a complete waste of time. Uh, let's see here. Anastasia B says, Dear Steve, congratulations. Frida deserves 12.9 subscribers. Poor little bean, sound asleep. Uh, I know, I know, eyes on the prize. My question is, do you think E.H. Carr's multiple volumes on Soviet history and economy are worth reading? I haven't read them. I think I've read one. I don't know the author well enough to know whether or not the whole of the body of work is worth reading at all. Uh, Ranch Elder says, do you spend any time listening to music? If so, which genres? Any favorite musical artists? All John Philip Sousa. All the time. <laughs> uh, Jem Jem says a rather contentious question, but do you think there's any truth to the rumor that the 17th Earl of Oxford was Shakespeare? Well, Shakespeare was Shakespeare, right? There's ample documentary evidence for a person named Shakespeare who was from Stratford and Avon and who worked in the London theater before retiring <laughs> and being a businessman. So the Earl of Oxford was not Shakespeare. We know there's separate documentary evidence that both of them existed. If you mean, did the Earl of Oxford write the plays of Shakespeare? I doubt it. I doubt it very much. I doubt the Earl of Oxford had any hand in, in even collaborations, even unsigned collaborations. The timeline just doesn't line up. He's mainly attractive, I think, to, to uh, proponents because he's a, a nobleman. I, other than that, I don't see much in the way to recommend him. Um, Nefrayal says, how well are you aware of the censorship alterations put into audiobooks and reprints as opposed to original text? I don't know about reprints of books. I know that uh, I've heard tales about how this is very, very prominent in audiobooks, that they, they change quite a bit. I don't know anything about it, though, because I don't listen to audiobooks. Uh, Jenny Parks says, hi, Steve. Number one, would you ever do an indie or self-published video? Um, I don't know what that means. Aren't all of my videos indie? <laughs> they are all self-published. I know that. Sorry if you can hear uh, Gaspar Leaf Blower in the background. It's been going on for some time now. I imagine that neighbors have called the police already, so you'll be hearing first sirens and then gunshots as the person who's using the leaf powered glass blower has to be shot dead and then pried off the device. So just ignore background noise. I, it's a slow morning and it's kind of warm, so maybe the neighbors haven't. Uh, if, if it's still happening when I'm finished with these Q&As, I'll call the police, they'll send a squad and kill the person. Uh, but anyway, uh, number two, are you worried about the Rings of Power show? I am worried. Worried in what way? Worried that it's not going to be good? It's not going to be good. Worried that it's going to be more uh, woke BS crammed down your throat, more your grandparents are bad people 
BS crammed down your throat, you know already it's going to be that. You know it's going to be that. So there's no use in hoping that it's not. It is certainly going to be that. So, <laughs> so no, I'm not worried, because in order to be worried, I'd have to have my hopes up, and they're not. <laughs> I'm not from the very beginning. No way. No way at all. Uh, and I'm not worried about what follows. I, I am the the mind frame in Hollywood and in the circles of Hollywood occupied by Amazon and gigantic money brokers like them uh, is if the audience hates what we're doing, let's do more of it. That it's totally inverted. It's totally Alice through the looking glass, in a way that I never thought would happen. We'll we're willing to take billions of dollars in loss because we're going to do what our audience doesn't like. Once we figure out what they don't want us to do, we're going to do it. The only example in recent times that hasn't done that is Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Other than that, everything has. And by now, it's intentional. By now, the people at the creative meetings, the pitch meetings, know what they're pitching. And uh, after The Rings of Power fails catastrophically and is savaged by the critics, that savaging is going to be viewed by Amazon as praise. <laughs> that is how things have inverted. They're going to say the more people are howling that they hate this, the more we will commit to it. And they're committed to Lord of the Rings. And it has already been all but decided at these creative meetings on a black Gandalf. So I, I, it, I wouldn't be worried if I were you. I would just leave it be. Just let it go. You have the Peter Jackson trilogy. If I were you, I would carefully hold on to your DVDs of the Peter Jackson trilogy because the people who own the rights to those trilogies can go back and change them. I would hold on to them if I were you. Uh, but And you also have the the book, of course. So I wouldn't worry about the show. Uh, Chris T says, Hi Steve, what are your thoughts on dogs that are bred for appearance but have caused the dog to have various breathing problems? Yeah. yeah I meet some of those dogs on our walks. Uh, do you think there should be a ban on this type of selective breeding? Common morality should be the ban. No one should have the power to ban it. No. Or anything else. Uh, more controversially, what about dogs who were bred for fighting and still have instinctual aggression? I have never seen instinctual aggression. I think it's all breeding. Torturing is what you mean. Torturing in order to get a dog to fight on sight, to fight silently, to fight on instinct, to fight anything it sees. No dog is born that way. So I don't believe really in instinctual aggression. Maybe that's just me. It certainly would never be shown to me, so maybe I would need it to be in order to believe it. Uh, a late June on the range question. Why do you think Karl May was so insanely popular in Germany and other European countries? Uh, well, his... His books are fairly good pot boilers, but he also had a fairly high-profile recommender for a while there. That might have had something to do with it. Uh, have you watched any videos from the channel Cartoonist Kayfabe? I have, yes. Uh, Chris T., you've talked about your enjoyment of superhero comics. Do you also enjoy funny comics? What are some of your favorites? Of course I do. Yes, Pogo, I've mentioned many times before, is a favorite of mine. Lil Abner is genius absolute genius, but also in more recent times, Calvin and Hobbes, the great Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, so yeah, uh, what are your thoughts on the alternative comics to those that have come in their wake, like Robert Crumb, Dan Klaus, Art Spiegelman, the Hernandez brothers, Chris Ware? I don't like them. No one in them is from Krypton. No one in them is wearing spandex. No one in them is wearing uh, uh, underpants on the outside. I, I, they're not for me. They're meant for a different audience, not me. Uh, Thomas says, Hi Steve, what do you make of the Robin Hobb and her Realm of the Elderlings fantasy series? Also her work under the name of Megan Lindholm. Thanks. Well, I know that I'm bucking all of BookTube. BookTube's just consensus across the board. Uh, but I, Robin Hobb is not all that good. I, uh, people have devoted whole channels to how great she is, and I, I'm certainly glad that they're enjoying it. I'm, sure, I'm certainly glad that those books pull them in and involve them that way, but pff, I sure don't see it. <laughs> Not any of it. Not any of it. Uh, Andrew Russell says, You constantly chastise us for asking, have you read questions? I do. There haven't been any so far. Uh, but is there a book you have not read that you really wish you had time for? What with your job responsibilities as a book critic? My job responsibilities as a book critic is to read books. <laughs> so it's not taking time away from reading. No. I The books that I haven't read yet, I am going to get to this year. I'm not, not worried about the rest of it. I'll, the rest of it will come randomly as i as it as it happens as chance happens at the brattle bookshop once i am free to leave my own home and go back to the brattle bookshop when i get there i love to re, to explore or re-explore but otherwise no uh let's see here nw says what books would you recommend to get a better understanding of chinese history or chinese civilization 
Uh, it was a book by Stephen Owen, in a big anthology of Chinese literature that has a lot of historical backgrounding in it. I'd recommend that. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. The editor is Stephen Owen. Not 100% sure on the title of the thing, Anthology of Classic Chinese Literature or something like that. Uh, Jim's Books, Reading, and Stuff. Uh, what is the best book about walking the Appalachian Trail for, for someone with no intention of walking the Appalachian Trail? Uh, I would say A Door into Another Land by Chris Holman. Is, was, I've read a lot of books on, on walking the, the Appalachian Trail, uh, but I, I like that one a lot. There's also another one, I, the title's Escaping Me, by an older woman who did the walk, who did the Appalachian Trail, uh, at a time when people were starting to say the trail could only be done by professionals, hardy you know, spandex wearing athletes, and she did it and wrote a, a really charming book. I think she got a lot of help to write it, but it's a really charming, I don't remember the name of it, but it's a really charming book. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're fine. Uh, Gunnar says, Steve, hey, Steve, are some dog breeds inherently more dangerous than others? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, because some of them are bigger and more powerful. That's all. That's all. Those can be more dangerous than, than others, but that's all. Otherwise, they have to be trained to be dangerous. Um, N.P. Hunt says, What do you think about the recently discovered Tolkien manuscripts, which are apparently going to sell for at least 15,000 pounds? Am I wrong in thinking that Christopher Tolkien had said in the last couple of years that he was basically done with releasing slash milking his father's work? He did say that. Uh, and then proved it by dying. <laughs> uh, I thought the special edition Lord of the Rings with original Tolkien illustrations was supposed to be the final thing to be released. Oh, well, no. No, the publisher will repackage these things forever. Uh, I've already heard plans for a, 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 the next gala Lord of the Rings release, which will have uh, artwork from the Peter Jackson movie trilogy. I think the idea is that the, I forget the name of the artist, there was a famous great artist who did all the conceptual art for Peter Jackson's first trilogy. Uh, I forget the name of that artist. Some of you will know that name, but the rumor is that though there's going to be a, a the next who never knows how many years down the line it will be. It's going to be a one volume, a Lord of the Rings with that artwork interspersed throughout at pertinent points when that artwork might come up. That would be amazing. But the publisher is going to keep repackaging that stuff. You're talking about new stuff, and there isn't any new stuff. <laughs> I don't know what this, these new documents will be, but they won't be anything new. Uh, Bearing this in mind, who is worse, Christopher Tolkien or Brian Herbert? I think they both have a lot to answer for. Uh, why would you do that to your father's literary legacy, or try to? Why would you do that? Why would you water it down so bad? Uh, but I, the fans say different, that's for sure. Uh, Skolger Svartersticken, number one. Why do bros like the art of war so much? Because they view themselves as carving out empires. They view themselves as leading armies in order to make an empire. So military classic is all important for them. It doesn't matter that they're wearing an Iron Maiden t-shirt to work the overnight shift at the local warehouse and then getting takeout on the way home and playing video games until they fall asleep. They still think of themselves as Genghis Khan trying to carve out an empire. Uh, number two, since you are a massive Simpsons fan, what do you think of Futurama? For me, Futurama is vastly superior. You are incorrect. But Futurama, when it's good, is really good. Naturally, I absolutely idolize the classic Star Trek episode. Oh my god, the Star Trek episode of Futurama is classic TV. The minute I watched it, I knew that I was seeing that. I love it so much. I love it so much. But they couldn't get Scotty, so they have Welshie. <laughs> Where Lennon, Leonard Nimoy looks at his sculpted abs and says, yep, it's definitely me. <laughs> uh, but it, The Simpsons is much better. Uh, no, Sierra. Number three, are you excited for the revival of the show? Not particularly, no. Uh, number four, have you ever met someone like Bender Bending Rodriguez in real life? Tell us about it. Have you ever met a Bender in real life? A robot? No. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, number five, since you've been literally everywhere except Australia, tell us how did you get into Area 51? Is it true that when Bob Lazar opened the alien spacecraft to reverse engineer it, inside it was written, Steve was here? <laughs> well, you're joking, because you like to poke fun at the sexy influencer in the room. Uh, but I actually have been to, to Area 51, and I came to it uh, through more or less the back door. My dogs and I came down from the mountains. And we didn't. I didn't know where we were. I had no idea what this this set of buildings was in front of us with fences and high towers. Uh, and we were greeted very cordially. The guys that were there just wanted something to break up the day. They knew right away that we weren't any kind of 
threat or danger, no kind of gotcha journalism or anything like that. They were very intrigued by the crowd of canines around me, especially when one of them, an older guy, uh, said he, he was sort of watching very intently. And I said, you know, I noticed the, I was talking to the younger guys and I noticed he was watching intently. I said, not to worry, uh, my dogs are completely under my control. They won't bother anybody. And he said, I'm not looking at your dogs. And then I remember that at the moment, the group that I brought down from the from the hills I included some coyotes, and he had noticed that that was true, and that they shouldn't be palling around with dogs. They shouldn't have been willing to come anywhere near human habitation, but there they were. I, I had to reassure him, too, though they are my babies as well, and they also will not bother you. Uh, I even got a kind of tour, a little bit of the facility, the parts that, the, that you know, that a non- credentialed member of the public could see. It's no big deal at all. I couldn't see any of the research and development stuff, but uh, I didn't want to. I, I didn't want any trouble at all. I was perfectly willing to walk back out into the desert and just give the place a wide berth. The guy said, the guys all said, no, no need, no need. We'll show you around a bit. You can have some water if you want, maybe some treats for the dogs, but, and, and then you can just go out the front door. You can go out the front gate. No need to worry. There's no trouble here. This was a long, long time ago, but I want to point out uh, there isn't any alien spacecraft at Area 51. I don't have to go into the bottles of the place to know that, and there never has been. The, the, the etiology, the origin of the story of aliens at Area 51 is extremely well documented. Uh, it, from the very beginning, from the very first start, from the first guy who found something, a piece of fabric on his land, there, there are no aliens. <laughs> there, are no, there are no aliens that visited Earth. There are no downed Ferengis in Area 51. Uh, but anyway, we're going to stop on Area 51, and we'll come back for the next one.